Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for Swing Left's first panel in our Stronger Democracy series. My name is Lottie Ash. I'm Swing Left's campaigns manager, and I am currently taking lead in Virginia. And tonight's topic is going to be maintaining the Democratic trifecta in Virginia. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Please feel free to use the chat uh, to introduce yourself. We're seeing some great folks introducing themselves from all across the country right now. It's fantastic to see so many familiar names and to see people calling in from everywhere. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, you can use the Q&A feature to ask some questions. We're going to try to get, some, uh, get to some questions from the audience at the end of the panel here. So please feel free to use it. Um, we will also have Swing Left staffers responding in real time Time in case there are some questions that we aren't able to get to um, publicly for all of our panelists. Um, and on that note, I would love to talk a little bit about why we're here tonight. So Virginia is the first statewide election since the Biden administration took office. We are incredibly excited to be um, playing in Virginia this year, supporting candidates up and down the ticket to ensure that we maintain the Democratic trifecta in Virginia and keep fighting for Democrats. This is the first time, again, since the Biden administration took office. So for all intents and purposes, it's a bit of a report card for the Biden administration. This is a chance for Democrats ac across the country to show that we are still here and we have the momentum to keep going and we are going to be fighting to ensure that rights are protected across the country. We're seeing left and right um, how important state governments are as we see um, our rights challenged in the Supreme Court and as we see red states uh, pass voter suppression laws. This is just even further proof that we need to continue fighting up and down the ballot to make sure that Democrats are in office fighting for us to protect our rights. So um, this is where the midterm start. This is a chance for us to really get that momentum going, a chance for us to take control of the narrative and to show that Democrats are the, is the party that works for people. Um, looking back quickly on Virginia, in 2019, we secured the House of, uh, Democrats secured the House of Delegates and the State Senate after securing the governor's mansion in 2017. Um, this is amazing and huge. We've seen the positive effects that a Democratic trifecta has had for very real people in the state of Virginia. Um, just a couple of policy accomplishments that we've seen. Um, since Democrats have taken office, Virginia Democrats um, have, uh, have turned Virginia into the first Southern state to abolish the death penalty, the first Southern state to legalize recreational marijuana. Um, Virginia Democrats passed the Virginia Voting Rights Act and also passed LGBTQ non-discrimination bills. Um, that said, even with all these positive changes, um, we still have a lot of work to do, and we're very excited to be talking about that and many other things in tonight's panel. Um, we have in Virginia has their primary on June 8th, and after the primary, we're expecting things to pick up and really start, uh, really hit the ground running. So we're really excited to have you all here with us tonight as we get started with all of the work that we have to do um, as we head into 2021, 2022, and beyond fighting to protect um, our rights and fighting to elect Democrats up and down the ticket. Um, with that, I'm very excited to introduce some of our panelists. Um, first, I would like to introduce Congresswoman Elaine Loria. Um, Congresswoman Loria represents Virginia's second di district in the US House of Representatives. She decided to run for office upon retiring from the Navy after 20 years of service at the rank of commander. Swing Left was proud to support her in her 2018 race in which she took on an entrenched GOP incumbent to flip her seat from red to blue. In Congress, she serves in the Veterans Affairs Committee, the House Committee for Homeland Security, and as vice chair of the, of the House Armed Services Committee. Hello, Congresswoman, thank you for joining us. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Delegate Alex Askew. He serves in the Virginia House of Delegates representing Virginia Beach. He, like Congresswoman Loria, is also a Swing Left alumni, and we are very proud to have supported him in 2019 and are even more proud of what he's accomplished for the 85th District since. This includes bills signed into law from legislations on lead water testing in schools and daycares to expanded workers' comp for firefighters and more. Uh, welcome, Delegate Askey. We're excited to have you on tonight. Um, next, I am very excited to introduce Fram Wynn. She is an award-winning activist and community leader who co-founded New Virginia Majority in 2007, where she serves as co-executive director. Under her leadership, New Virginia Majority has expanded the Virginia electorate, reshaping the political landscape and building power for black and brown people across the state. Welcome, Tram. We're very excited to have you on tonight. 
Finally, I'm excited to introduce Sean Warner. Sean is here with us from the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, or the DLCC, where he covers Virginia as a senior regional political director. The DLCC works at the state level all over the country to elect Democrats to state legislatures and to win uh, Democratic control of chambers. Please uh, welcome them in the chat, say some nice words, say hello. We are very excited to uh, welcome Congressman Loria, Delegate Askew, Tram Wynn, and Sean Warner to our panel here tonight. So to jump right in, um, let's start off with some recent history. We were all very involved in the 2019 Virginia elections where Democrats won control of the legislature resulting in some like very real accomplishments that wouldn't have been possible without a democratic trifecta. Um, and because of that, we are very excited to see just some absolutely amazing legislation passed. Um, Delegate Askew, I would love to hear from you what policies would you say have been Democrats most significant since securing the trifecta uh, and winning unified power in Virginia? Absolutely, Lottie and the rest of the swing left and folks from across the country. Thanks so much for joining us tonight and thank you for having me. Uh, before I answer your question, I do want to embarrass Tram a little bit. It was her, she had a big birthday yesterday, so I want to wish her a uh, happy birthday, happy belated birthday. So happy birthday, Tram. Um, but yeah, uh, like you said, Lottie, in your introduction, we've accomplished a lot. Um, and I think I have a very unique experience uh, before I won my election and the Democrats took the majority in the House, uh, delegates as well, uh, retaining the governor's mansion as well as the Senate. Uh, I saw firsthand uh, when Republicans had power, you know, the bills that they, they passed, uh, you know, where they fought restrict access to health care uh, and created barriers to voting. Uh, but over the past two years, since we've had the majority, uh, we've made significant gains and achievements. We passed the ERA. Uh, we decriminalized first and then uh, later legalized adult use marijuana. Uh, we increased teacher pay uh, as well as increased pay for their support staff. Uh, we passed the Virginia Clean Economy Act, uh, which we have a goal of eliminating our carbon, per and carbon footprint by 2050. Uh, we increased the minimum wage, which was huge. We were doing it incrementally in over a few years, but you know that was the first time in nearly 12 years. And this would be uh, an opportunity for nearly 200,000 uh, low-income Virginians to uh, finally be able to uh, you know, create and gain a livable wage so they can pay for groceries and everyday necessities, you know, rent. Uh, became the first, uh, and, and I never truthfully thought this would happen, but we became the first Southern state to abolish the death penalty, uh, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, with, with help from groups like the Virginia Majority and other groups, we uh, increased access to the ballot box. You know, we expanded uh, early voting. We made election day a national holiday, um, made same day voter registration a possibility. Um, and passed the Virginia Values Act, which protects the LGBTQ uh, plus community from discrimination in the workplace. So uh, we've done you know, a lot in these two years and I look forward to doing more uh, once reelected with you all's help. But it's been a, a fun time for the past two years, uh, though, of course, we've had the pandemic and we've been fighting through that. Uh, but it's just been great to pass uh, you know, a bunch of legislation that's helped millions of uh, Virginians. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for everything, Delegate Askew. And like a quick personal note, I'm actually from Virginia and um, in high school, uh, my AP government teacher had us study the House of Delegates and create a scrapbook with all of the um, legislation that was passed. However, when I was in high school, uh, Virginia was a very, very red state. Um, and let's just say I wish I was able to, I was creating that scrapbook now so I could keep track of all of the accomplishments Democrats have um, had instead of keeping track of some of the not so great bills that Republicans were passing way back when. So thank you for everything um, that you and Democrats have been uh, accomplishment, accomplishing in, rich, in Richmond. Wow, let's see if I can speak. <laughs> um, awesome. I am going to go to the birthday girl next. Um, Tram, I would love to hear from you about um, what still needs to be addressed next session in your opinion. And happy belated birthday, by the way. Thanks, Lottie, and thank you. For embarrassing me, Delegate asked you, but I appreciate the birthday wishes. I did have a big birthday yesterday. I turned 40. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, when I think about everything that we have accomplished um, since 2019, right, in the 2020 and the 2021 session, it is absolutely breathtaking. As Delegate asked you mentioned, um, you know, super, you know, uh, we lost count of how many first in the South bills that we passed this year, because it just kept coming and coming and coming. And I just reflect back on the last 10 years and, you know, 10 years ago, people would never have thought that we would be able to change 
the Virginia political landscape as significantly as we have done. Um, and that's a testament to, to everybody who has, you know, contributed time, uh, energy, dollars, everything, everybody um, on this panel, all of you from across the country. So, so thank you. Um, we pat like a new Virginia majority's agenda is pretty is pretty large as you can imagine we work with a lot of underrepresented communities folks that have been left out for so long and in the last two years alone i we i did a count the other the other day we passed over 165 pieces of legislation that we have been working on some for as long as you know 11 12 years some that were newer on our agenda but as Lottie, you asked, like, what still needs to be addressed? And there's still a lot more that needs to be addressed, right? Like as much progress as we have made, we need to keep going. And that's what's at stake this year in this election cycle. Um, I think about, you know, the, the need to pass paid family and medical leave, especially um, now as folks, workers are, are trying to struggle to not only, you know, be able to work and provide for their families, but if they get sick. Um, or if a family member gets sick, what happens then, right? Are they able to actually continue to care for their family? Um, especially now with COVID that is, you know, that has exposed so much of the inequalities and equities that our communities face. Um, and so along those lines, right, what does a just COVID recovery look like that leaves no person behind? I think that's gonna be critically important. And Delegate, I ask you, I don't envy you, <laughs> your, um, your job, especially as you make some of these hard decisions. And we know we're going back into to special session shortly. And so the work never ends. Um, so, so I think those are some big things, you know, I'd be remiss to not talk about voting rights, which is always like near and dear to me and our heart work, especially right now, as we see across the country, efforts um, in state after state after state to roll back our, our right to vote. Um, we made great progress this year, the first state in the South to pass a Voting Rights Act. Um, the most comprehensive voting rights act in the in the country, actually. So no knock to like California and Washington and Oregon, our friends from those states on, on the panel uh, on the call tonight. But you know, we have the most comprehensive voting rights act um, in the country, but we're not done. We have to pass a constitutional amendment to establish the right to vote to make sure that folks who are currently incarcerated because of a felony conviction upon release will have those rights automatically restored. And that is a change in our constitution that it's you know, at least for me, a 12 year fight in the making. And I'm so excited to finally, hopefully see that across the finish line in 2022. So all that's to say, there's a lot that we have to do um, on every single topic, because if you think about it, we're trying to unpack, you know, a centuries old system that has left a lot of people behind and that has created so many injustices. And, you know, we've got a long way to go, but we are certainly on the path there because we have um, great champions like Delegate Askew in, in our General Assembly and Congresswoman Luria in Congress um, that we, we can get this done. So I appreciate, uh, I appreciate everybody's efforts and everybody's work to help us get there. Yes, absolutely. And yes, thank you, Tram. And you're right, we have a lot of work to do. We're really up against um, a century of inequities that we're um, fighting against and that we are um, continuing to uh, chisel away at. So I'm very grateful to be on this call with everyone tonight to talk about that. Um, it's we've, It's been referenced a couple of times, but um, of course state governments don't exist in a vacuum. We um, live in a national political environment um, and the pandemic has made that especially relevant that in order to really get any policy or legislation implemented in like a very meaningful way, um, the federal government and state governments have to work together. Um, so Congressman Loria, I would be curious to hear from you, how has the Democratic trifecta in Virginia changed the, um, the way your work at the federal level impacts the lives of your constituents? Well, great. Well, thank you so much for having me tonight. And I before I answer, I just have to say thank you to Swing Left. I mean, you guys uh, were behind me in 2018 in a seat that was really difficult to flip. Um, and we won here in Virginia's second district and actually flipped the delegation um, from four seven to seven four, and we're able to hold all of those seats again in 2020 in a really tough race. And so if you wanna talk about federal, state and local, I think in Hampton Roads, we have a great team. I have really tried to, uh, work as closely as possible with our delegates and state senators and the General Assembly, our local elected officials. And it's so great to be here with Alex because I was just so thrilled uh, when he won in 2019. And I think that, you know, being able to work together, federal, state and local, like you said, um, is really important and has been highlighted by the issues that we've seen during the COVID pandemic. 
Um, you know, at the federal level, we were able to pass lots of different, you know, funding packages that were very helpful to people in the community. Uh, but really, it took the federal um, assistance, but the state and local government to carry out these programs to implement testing programs to get vaccines out um, to, you know, help with all of the different things on the ground in the community to help people who are really struggling during, during a very difficult time. So it was more important than ever. Um, that we paired with our um, state and local partners to do that. And, you know, Alex is one of those great people, um, you know, in the General Assembly in Virginia and his district's in Virginia Beach inside of our congressional district. So, you know, working really closely together and being able to reach out to the General Assembly and say, you know, here's what we're thinking at the federal level. How would you implement this? It, it takes teamwork and building a team at every level of government. So, you know, I'm all in to make sure that we keep the this majority in the Virginia General Assembly. There's only five seat majority. Um, and Alex is one of those folks who's in that top five, you know, really tough races that we have to make sure he gets back. So, you know, being able to keep this ability um, to, to have, you know, the right people on every level of the team at federal, state, and local means we've got to make sure that Alex can come back. And I'm so proud that Swing Left is, you know, here supporting Alex. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Congressman Loria. And thank you for all of your hard work that you're doing to make sure that Virginians are getting the COVID relief that they need and also the vaccines that we need. Um, I personally got my shot in Virginia. I saw how well it was implemented, was incredibly impressed. So thank you all for everything that you're doing. It's been absolutely incredible. Um, along those lines, Delegate asked you, um, similarly, with Democrats now in control of the federal government, how has that impacted your work at the state level, um, specifically for your constituents or for Virginians at large? Absolutely, and thank you. And, and though these times uh, have been tough, uh, one of the easiest things uh, that we've had had to do is uh, to work with, you know, my friend, Congressman Lawyer and our congressional delegation. Um, you know, they've worked hard to pass the uh, American Rescue Plan, make sure uh, we get protection, whether it be uh, to our localities or whether it be a uh, rolling out of, of tests uh, before and now vaccinations. We've uh, worked well together hand in hand and I'm, I'm proud to call uh, the Congresswoman my friend anytime, um, you know, she needs to discuss something. She calls me and, and I do the same and we've had a really good working relationship since I've been in the House, um, you know, delegates, but uh, I think we've just, uh, you know, just due to our, our location um, to DC, you know, a lot of folks that, you know, work for the federal government in Northern Virginia, not too many here unless, uh, you know, we're just talking about Department, Department of Defense, uh, other contracts, but we've had a, a great work relationship and hope to continue that uh, while retaining the uh, majority in the House and uh, as well as with the, in the gubernatorial, winning the gubernatorial race. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you, Delegate Askew. And that's exactly it. Swing Left is very excited to be here fighting to protect the trifecta in Virginia. And then also as we head into the midterms, fighting to make sure we keep the U.S. House and uh, keep the U.S. Senate and just really continuing to make sure that Democrats are able to do their jobs and help people. Um, so along those lines, we know that the work is far from done. We've talked about it a little bit already. Um, and Virginia is a really unique state in that we are constantly having elections. Every year is an election year in Virginia. Um, and that means that it's really important to keep uh, our voters and our volunteers engaged and excited and active. And um, I think everyone knows on that call, that, that on this call, that, that can be a little difficult. Um, we see that uh, compared to presidential cycles, voter turnout typically drops in midterm elections. And that happens even more so in odd year elections. Um, so, Tram, I would love to hear from you after such an exhausting presidential cycle. Um, how do we keep voters and fellow volunteers engaged and excited with the Virginia elections? Listen, I always think our I love democracy. I love it with all my heart. <laughs> and at the same time, I'm like, God, I, like this election cycle that Virginians have to face is both a blessing and a curse, right? Because we never get a break. Um, in fact, I think there was one stretch where we had, because of the special elections and everything else, we had 14 straight months of an election every month at somewhere in Virginia. So we love democracy. Um, that being said, I mean, I think if we don't, if we view elections as not our finish line, right, it's not just about winning in November or May or whenever the election is and that like we, we get somebody like Delegate Askew elected and that's it, we're done, then of course it's going to be hard to, to pick up, you know, and keep people engaged. But the way that we approach our work is that, you know, we engage people, we engage voters on what matters to them, right? What, what the issues that are important to them, like the, we talk to them, we have real authentic conversations and we, it, we mobilize them. 
on the issues. And then we, you know, we connect those issues to who represents them, right? You're gonna have a better chance of fixing our criminal legal system, for example, and getting greater police accountability and transparency if you have somebody in office who agrees with you, right? Who understands those lived experiences that your community is facing. And, and because November isn't our finish line and because our state legislative session starts in January, just two months after an election cycle, we go back to these voters, you know, like Thanksgiving, sure, that's an important holiday and people wanna break, but we are calling folks, we're door knocking again and we're saying, hey, remember when we talked to you about healthcare or about education because you said that that was really important to you? Well, guess what? We have an opportunity to actually work on that and to advocate for it and hold these new elected officials accountable. And that was a big significant part, I think, of being able to get as much accomplished as we did in these last two years, because I think um, the new General Assembly, the new legislature felt this urgency, right? That like they were elected for a reason, right? And that they needed to deliver on their campaign promises. And I think now, as we think about the election cycle that we have in front of us, we have, we have a chance to show voters that, see, it mattered. Elections have consequences. When you voted to fix you know, our healthcare system, when you voted to fix our education system, when you voted to increase the minimum wage and all of these things, and we delivered, then we gotta show up again to make sure that we can continue to deliver, right? And so it's that year round engagement that I think is absolutely critical. And it's not just a boom and bust cycle where we're only talking to voters when we need them to turn out to vote because that is purely transactional and we all see right through it, right? Voters see right through it. Um, and so like, I think that's, that, that's the key piece in terms of keeping both voters and volunteers engaged is that there's a, there's a bigger purpose here. And um, why do elections matter? Because of the policy outcomes and the impact that it will have on our lives. And I think in the last two years, we've really shown that, you know, it, it can make a difference. I mean, talk about the complete 180 that we've done in this, um, in this great Commonwealth. And so uh, people are excited. Uh, I mean, we might be tired, but I think in general, uh, voters are excited. And, you know, Sean's gonna talk a little bit more about what's at stake this year, but there's a lot at stake and we're excited to make sure that, you know, we can get it done and we're excited to have swing left, um, you know, as a part of that, that effort. Yeah, absolutely. And like, exactly. And it's so great to hear like, and see the very real effects that electing Democrats has had on, on voters and has had on constituents in Virginia. And you talked a little bit about this, but the, um, something that really st stood out about your answer was like the idea that we are not just going to voters when we need something to them, for, uh, when we need something from them. We're continuing to engage, we're continuing to talk. And um, I, we actually just recently had a group phone banking from Swing Left for one of our supported delegates and they were doing a vaccine phone bank. So they were calling to make sure everyone had the information about where they could get their shots, so on and so forth, make sure that they knew um, what they needed to bring, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, one of our volunteers came back and told us this absolutely heartwarming story um, about how she got a voter on the phone. And when she said, oh, I'm calling with a campaign, they're like, I don't want to talk to you. She's like, wait, 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 I'm actually calling about vaccines. I want to make sure, blah, blah, blah. And she kept the, the voter on the phone and the constituent said like, wow, I have never, like, this is amazing. Like, I would love to hear more about Delegate, it was it was for Delegate Cole. I'd love to hear more about Delegate Cole because this is one of the first times that someone has reached out to me to ask me how I'm doing and to ask me about this and to really connect with me and not just ask me to do something for them. And I thought that that was just incredibly moving and is really um, indicative of the Virginia Democratic Party and the um, the delegates that we have in office and also the Congress, uh, our Congress people, our governor and um, our senators. It's really just absolutely amazing to see. Um, so yes, thank you. Um, but to return a little bit to action and to zoom out a bit, um, Sean, I would love to hear from you what you think the challenges and opportunities the DLCC ant um, anticipates with sustaining vo um, voter engagement now that we've moved Oops, looks like we lost Congresswoman Loria. Um, but now that we've, uh, we're have we moving post-2020. 
Sure. And I also want to, I'm going to embarrass Tram just a little bit more because she also <laughs> didn't mention that after the election, she went to Georgia. So I want to thank you for our uh, Democratic majority in the Senate. Every time I see something on Facebook from Tram, she's just constantly there doing the work. And I just wanted to lodge you for that. And thank you for the majority in the Senate and also wish you a happy birthday. I think that the challenges and the opportunities are almost one of the same. And I think that I love Tram's answer about how do we build back a more just uh, system post COVID. I think that you know the challenges that we had in 2020 is we know that there's social science that shows that when a delegate knocks on someone's door, they develop that real relationship. It was much more difficult. I'm ready to be out of the Brady Bunch squares and actually get out and knock on doors. And I think that that is one of the opportunities. I think by us being able to talk to all of the amazing things that the Democrats accomplished in the House with a lot of support from a lot of people on this call and a lot of people doing the hard advocacy work, we can tell the story about Virginia being a responsive government. Seeing their response to COVID is going to be the reason why we're able to get out back on those doors. Um, but Republicans very naively early on were like, you need to open schools, you need to open schools, you need to open schools. And we did it safely. And we opened the schools and the schools will, will be open. And so I think that the more that we can hear what actually matters to the voters uh, and understand what their needs are, and then also highlight that if we do not return these Democrats to the House of Delegates, that we're gonna go back to the old system of, you know, lobbyists controlling the public policy, people you know, looking out for the rich, not necessarily worrying about the LGBTQ community or any communities of color that have been disproportionately impacted by this, uh, by this pandemic. And because the Democrats have been so bold uh, in their actions, we definitely have a, a very easy case to make to them, but we have to break through. And I think that that is the huge opportunity that we have in 2022 is to go back to some civility, right? It's nice not to have a tweet every 10 seconds that someone's talking about, but actually to go meet people at their kitchen tables and talk to them about what is going on. And I think that by making sure that we are focusing our conversations uh, it, with people in the center um, is really kind of the opportunity for us to keep people engaged. And then obviously in Virginia with the house potentially up in 21, 22 new districts, and again, 23, there will be a natural inclination for us to be able to have conversations with voters about their state government. Yes, absolutely. I particularly love your Brady Bunch Squares reference. I feel that on a deep and personal level. Um, I feel like I am just constantly like staring at myself, which is really fun for all of us. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think that makes complete sense. And it's going to be really exciting to be able to meet voters where they're at again and talk to them and really point to all of the incredible work that has been happening. And kind of along those lines, I have a question for both Sean and Tram about how um, organizing in the pandemic changed and what you all think is going to be sustaining uh, and will continue as we come out of this pandemic and what um, what tactics were used and what worked as we were in this really unprecedented time. So Tram, I'd love to hear first from you about Virginia specifically and reaching some harder to reach voters. And then Sean, I'd love to hear from you and on the more national scale. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of our success over the years has stemmed from our ability to make real connections with people, right? And the best way to make those real connections is not only meeting people where they are, but having that direct, oftentimes face-to-face -face conversations, right? Because you can sort of see and, and read body language and you know that the person approaching you is coming from a genuine place around, you know, what we need to to, to do together to achieve you know, the change that we wanna see. So of course, with the pandemic, uh, it upended all of that. Last year, I think all of us across the country um, really changed our campaign strategies and tactics, right? There was no more door to door um, for the most part. And I think you know, towards the home stretch of the campaign cycle, people started getting a little bit more comfortable being on the doors. Um, people would do lit drops at most. I think there was a widespread like, okay, let's just knock and run, like knock, drop a door hanger and leave. Um, at one, a couple of weekends, I drove up to Pennsylvania to, to volunteer um, on my own time. And I actually did door knocking because I was like, I'm good, I can do this. And I loved it. And I had real conversations with people. But that experience also showed me 
what we were missing when we can't do that door knocking and we, when we can't capture that real life data and, and, and it, it really affects our ability to not only understand if voters are still there or not, right? But also that feedback loop, right? We can make assumptions uh, around what it is that we should be talking to voters about. And we can look at the polls to sort of understand what are the issues that resonate most with voters. But those are just snapshots. When you're actually on the doors and when you're talking to people and having real life conversations, it creates a whole nother data rich, um, you know, uh, environment for us and dynamics where it's like that constant feedback loop where you can make adjustments to your program in real time. So all of that was missing. Um, you know, I would look at, I would knock on a door and someone would answer and they'd be like, that person hasn't lived here in like seven years. And I'm like, oh, but the contact history in the, in the minivan says that, you know, they've been contacted and it turns out it was a one-way contact, right? They might have, you know, received a voicemail or they might not, might have received a text, but there was no reply back, but it still showed up as, you know, this is a, a voter we still need a target. So all of that was 2020 um, and it was hard. And, you know, we started trying to think about other ways we can meet people where they are. I have, I am not um, a technologically savvy person. I will admit that. Our staff make fun of me all the time. But on my phone, because of the pandemic, I now have like 20 apps that I never knew how to use before. And um, because people, different communities use different things, right? WeChat, May We, uh, you know, whatever it is. Like, I'm like, okay, well, with this community, they are all on this little platform. So like, let's, let's go there. Um, so I think, you know, we all had to, you know, we all had to make those adjustments, but we needed to do it because again, this, this voter organizing, civic engagement, all of that requires us to, to meet people where they are. I will say that now that things are, um, looking better, uh, we have been back out on the doors, um, because, hey, Virginia's got elections every year and we're in the middle of one right now. We have a June, uh, eighth <laughs> primary in you know less than three weeks. Um, people will be turning out to elect and nominate our, our Democratic candidates uh, for this cycle. And um, early voting started a couple of weeks ago. So we've been, you know, since in the last two months, we've reached, um, we've done over 288,000 um, voter contact attempts, right? And that's been back out in the doors and it's been, it's been great. Um, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons from that. Contact rates are still low. People are still hesitant to open the doors. And so we're still gonna make some adjustments. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really changed a lot, this whole, um, you know, all, all of the COVID and, and all of the, the different uh, tactics that we've had to engage in. Yeah, absolutely. And like the act of meeting people where they're at digitally on top of um, like trying to create that in a digital space is so impressive and difficult. So yeah, that's um, fantastic to hear. Love that you're back on the doors. Uh, I did see Sean laugh when you said you were uh, in Pennsylvania during 2020. Um, so Sean, I would love to hear from you a little bit more about like the national on the national level, what we're seeing. Sure. So I think that, you know, in 2020 early on, we had to like first just recognize that we are all going through something that was extremely traumatic, right? And so for us to just call people and wanna talk about an election when our nation was already so deeply divided was just tone deaf, right? We needed to make sure and do wellness checks to see how people were doing, making sure that they had access to the resources, the limited resources that the federal government was giving at the time. Um, and we found that to be a really uh, therapeutic conversation for a lot of our volunteers because they wanted to engage in their democracy, but they didn't know if it was going to be appropriate. I think that moving forward and actually getting out onto the doors and being able to see um, voters actually at their homes uh, will hopefully tear down some of this division. Because if you've taken the time to come meet someone in their neighborhood, they are much more likely to engage in a conversation. A, a funny story in Arizona, a candidate who was a CPA walked up and knocked on the door and the, the, the husband answered and there was Fox News blaring in the background, socialism, socialism, socialism. And the guy says, are you a, a socialist? And he's like, no, I'm in a polo. I'm a CPA. I'm not a socialist. If you got to meet me, then you would understand that I just am trying to approach this in the best way that I think fits our values collectively. Uh, and it was a good conversation. He ended up getting the ID. I'm not certain if that person still ended up voting down ballot. But um, I think that the more that we're able to engage these conversations and also understand how we can kind of bring down the temperature um, so that people understand that 
the government is working for them. This is a massive job interview. You have to think about it as a job interview with thousands and thousands of voters, 80,000 in a delegate race, right? So just making sure that um, we're having those conversations and they're not, like Trent said, transactional and your quick ID get off going on to the next door. But uh, I think in a post-pandemic world, we're going to have to be much more sensitive and engage in longer form conversations than just very easy kind of IDs and go. Absolutely. I absolutely love that. And the job interview reference, uh, hey, no pressure, Delegate Askew and Congresswoman Laurier, you know, just like no pressure, just a constant job interview. <laughs> um, but like very similarly along those lines, um, Congresswoman Laurier, um, I would love to hear from you uh, since we've been changing so much about how we've had to interact with voters. What have you found most um, effective with staying in touch with your constituents specifically during such a difficult year? You're right. It has really been a very different year, you know, but through the election, you know, having a re-election in 2020 in this, um, you know, very different environment. And we certainly did, you know, get back to the doors towards the end, but um, focused a lot more on like a lot of new digital tools to reach people and phone banking and, you know, things like, um, you know, the, the postcards that groups around the country send and those types of things, you know, were just everything was cumulative in a way to reach people. But, you know, from my official office side and our way to communicate with people, um, you know, we really tried to to increase the outreach of our newsletters. Um, there was so much information to share for small business owners, for the PPP, Payroll Protection Program, or SBA loans and where to get testing. And, you know, we um, maybe overloaded with people with the information, um, but, you know, truly to this day, one of the things that I hear most frequently if I'm out at the grocery or running an errand or just anywhere I see somebody, a constituent, they're like, oh, it's so great to see you. And I want to thank you for the information that you've been providing us through your newsletters. And so just that ability to be able to provide meaningful information people during a very challenging time. Um, so you know, I told my team the other day, what do we have to do to like double annually the number of people who get our newsletters? Um, you know, because it's just really one of those things where I think, you know, we are doing a lot of work for people, but the hardest thing is reaching them and letting them know and letting them know where the resources are. So I found that a, a really valuable tool. And I think as Sean mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, those check-in calls, you know, early on in the pandemic, you know, we were just using our volunteers to call, call people and just check on how they were. And I think they did really appreciate that call. We weren't calling to ask for anything. You know, we were just yeah. checking in, hearing what was on people's mind and how we could take that back and work on their behalf. So, you know, you just have to adapt to the time and the place. And, you know, hopefully as we move forward into Alex's reelection, we'll be able to, you know, I mean, we, we should be, we are now, you know, able to get out on the doors and, and talk to people face to face, but you just have to, you know, meet the moment and meet the voters. Where yeah, absolutely. And that's such an like important thing to think about and talk about is how, difficult not being able to have in-person events can be for hearing what's actually affecting real people's like very real lives. And Delia, ask you, I know you just, well, I guess just is a bit of an exaggeration. It's been a couple months, but recently have come out of a session. Um, I want to ask the same question to you. What did you find most effective with keeping in touch with your constituents um, during these unprecedented times? Uh, absolutely. Um, it was a lot of, uh, you know, Brady Bunch uh, Zooms, uh, of <laughs> course. Uh, we tried to have uh, office hours, you know, typically we would either have them in an office or, you know, at a Starbucks or a local coffee shop, uh, but we try to set up individual times for constituents to uh, reach out to us. Um, it, it was interesting, uh, a lot of phone calls, right? I think people, we've sort of gone away from from phones, but uh, um, a lot of people were calling us our, our phones and, um, you know, I took some time to call those people that called in, whether it was for unemployment insurance or help with DMV appointments, just calling them back and checking on them and making sure uh, they've got what they needed, you know, through our, our constituent services. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, a lot of emails, uh, like the Congresswoman said, we definitely ramped up our, um, you know, our, our email list and try to make sure folks got our newsletter you know, we were we were in session, um, you know, during it. So we, we were actually in the house. We were on Zoom. So we spent a lot of time on the computer. So I spent a lot of time even writing personal letters to some folks, you know. Um, so it was all those all those things that, you know, Tram and other congressmen said and, and Sean. And it was just just trying to stay in touch. We um, had a couple of testing events where I had an opportunity to, uh, you know, see some folks. And we set up a table and passed out masks. And we also had some volunteer groups. Of passing out masks and, and visiting nursing homes, taking those masks that our volunteers, um, you know, instead of doing outreach and phone calls as they typically do and knock on doors, they're, they're creating masks and we're taking them to nursing homes. So we had an opportunity to visit some folks um, there. So 
difficult wow. time, but we made it through. So um, hopefully we'll be back in person on the doors. Yeah, absolutely. Those events sound incredible. And I can only imagine how meaningful that was, especially going to the nursing homes and talking to folks, especially during a time when so many people were isolated. Um, I mean, like I spent the last year in my childhood bedroom. It was really fun. My parents loved it. Uh, so we're, you know, really just doing great. And I totally understand. And um, having those conversations, reaching out to people um, on the bright side, because everyone was home, people were answering their phones. So um, in that some ways that made the conversations over the phones a lot more effective and easier. Um, but it's absolutely great to hear um, everything that y'all have done to keep in touch with folks. Um, to transition into the future a little bit, looking forward to 2022 and the midterms. Um, we all know Virginia is a bellwether state. Uh, it's often considered that for national elections, where it predicts what uh, the momentum is going to be. It predicts what's going to happen. Um, so knowing that, Congresswoman Loria, would you, can you talk briefly about how important talking to these voters in 2021 is going to be to holding Congress in 2022? Well, certainly. And if I see we have folks from around the country. So if you're not a Virginian, you might not be used to the fact that there's an election every year in Virginia. And um, Virginia always has a gubernatorial election. So governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, and the re-election of the General Assembly immediately after a presidential race. Um, 2016, you know, we all woke up the next day. We were very disappointed and we found out Donald Trump was our president. Well, Virginians got to work um, and we got Ralph Northam uh, elected as our governor and you know had a, a, a blue sweep of the ticket and took back a lot of seats in the General Assembly. Not quite enough to get the majority, but made huge strides. Um, and then comes Alex in 2019, and he was part of winning back the, the majority in, in the House of Delegates and the State Senate. And that is when you really can make a difference, when you've got a governor and you've got a General Assembly who's on the same page and wants to do good for people of the Commonwealth. So we got to keep that, right? Um, right now, um, there's a five-seat majority in the House of Delegates. Alex is one of those five people who has a really tough race. Am I allowed to ask people to donate? Alex needs your help. <laughs> Alex, you should put a link in there. If someone's interested in visiting your website and helping you, because um, I know swing left people came in and they helped me in 18. So they're not shy about that. They know it matters. Um, but you know what I'd say is it's team building. It's team building at the federal, state and local level. Um, so, you know, I was, you know, I, I, I showed up for canvases. I, um, you know, helped launch phone banks. I did all these things in 19. And at some point I said, like, I need to do more. So I actually decided I'm going to raise a quarter of a million dollars for the folks to flip the General Assembly. And I did that in like the last three weeks of the you know election. I said, I'm going to do this. And I found out I'm a heck of a lot better at asking for money for other people than for me. Um, but I did it. And I, um, you know, hopefully made a little, helped a little bit with some of the top seats, both in Hampton Roads and around Virginia. Um, and I'm, you know, and I'm in it again. I'm trying to help Alex and other folks, um, you know, make sure they have the resources to reach voters. Um, and it's team building. So we build this team. If you got to get out there and knock doors, the folks who are going to do that in even years and odd years, we're all on the same team, right? Um, so whatever we can do to help Alex, you know, I know that the same people and Alex will be right there beside me uh, when it's, you know, when I'm up for re-election in the midterm. So, you know, I really think team building is important and I really appreciate, you know, what your organization does to get people engaged from around the country and especially eyes on Virginia because, you know, we are really the bellwether um, and it's very unusual after a presidential. Um, actually, you know, when Terry McAuliffe was elected in 13, he's really kind of bucked the trend in the sense that, you um, they're generally, you know, the gubernatorial goes the other way. Um, and that's what happened um, the previous uh, presidential then Virginia gubernatorial. So, you know, it's tough. We got headwinds. We got headwinds at every level of this election, whether it's governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, and the House of Delegates. Um, and then, you know, Hampton Roads, our area of southeastern Virginia, if you're not, you know, familiar with Virginia geography, you know, the Republican ticket has everyone on that Republican ticket. Governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general has roots in Hampton Roads. So, I mean, they are gonna be down there. They know the community, they're gonna show up a lot and we've just gotta show up more, um, especially once we, you know, figure, you know, get our statewide ticket in the primary on June 8th. So um, Alex, we're here for you. And uh, thank you for being there for me in 20 as well. I love it. Congresswoman, you both read my mind and also spoke the swing left language. I'm not sure if you all saw in the beginning when we were starting our panel, everyone was like, is there going to be calls to action? Are you going to tell us what we can do? Um, because people are ramped up and ready to go and are ready to uh, really, you know, go, which is exciting. So on that note, um, now that we have talked about 
all of the accomplishments, how much there's left to do, um, how important Virginia is and how Virginia really is this bellwether state and is going to be a bit of a predictor of the midterms. Um, Delegate ask you, what can folks do in Virginia um, right now to uh, help you out, to help um, the to help Democrats up and down the ballot out to really affect the outcome of 2021? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and thanks, Lottie. Lottie. Um, you know, and we, we talked about all this great stuff that we've done, but everything is at stake in November. Um, you know, I'm one of the most competitive districts, one of the most competitive regions, as the Congresswoman said. Uh, you know, the the majority, holding the majority comes through Virginia Beach. So, you know, it's, we're, we're working on this now and, you know, with your help and, and other groups similar to yours, you know, we're working on building a base, you know, a base of volunteers, you know, looking to do some relational organizing, you know, get back uh, on the doors. As many people know, I got my start, uh, you know, on the Obama campaign in 2012, being an organizer, right? You know, registering voters, uh, knocking on doors, making phone calls, neighbor, you know, doing some neighborhood organizing. So, you know, we're, we're looking to go back to the grassroots, right? Um, you know, and of course we can't, uh, we can't do that without money, uh, right? As, as the Congresswoman said, it's a lot easier asking for money for other people, but sometimes you have to do it yourself because that's the, the nature of what we're in. But you know, in order to, you know, get up on TV, you know, in order to get the mailers, uh, in order to, uh, you know, pay organizers and my campaign staff, uh, you know, I need donations in order to, you know, continue doing this work. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's you know, we're, we're need to continue to, um, you know, lessen the burden of prescription drugs, right? We need to, uh, on families, we need to continue to invest in our infrastructure so folks, you know, don't have to sit in traffic on the way to or from work, on the way to pick up, taking their kids to school. Um, you know, we, we, we need to continue to you face these existential crises that we have in, in Hampton Roads and across the Commonwealth and really across the region of flooding, right? In, in Hampton Roads, you know, our, our, our oceans are rising and our, our, our ground is sinking, right? And it's not only a, um, you know, a, a, a tribe seeing folks and, you know, people need to have uh, flood insurance, right? But it's a, it's a uh, national security issue because we have, you know, bases here. So, you know, I just, as you said, a call to action. Now, I really uh, just ask for you all's help, you know, not only for myself, but for my colleagues to, you know, write the postcards, you know, text bank if we need you, uh, phone bank if we need you. And if anybody's close in any urban states or in Virginia, um, you know, here in Virginia, come down and knock on doors in some of these districts uh, that we that we need to hold on to in order to retain the majority. So, you know, I, I want to thank you all uh, so much for allowing me to speak to everyone and, and for all your hard work, not only for me, but for the Congresswoman and Democrats all over Virginia. So thanks again, Lottie and everyone else. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. And again, thank you for all the work that you've been doing. And thank you for such a wonderful call to action. Um, there's a lot at stake in Virginia this year. We need everyone's help. We are so lucky to have so many of you joining us here tonight. Um, as Delegate Askew said, we need you all to uh, make phone calls, knock on doors, uh, donate if you can. Um, but we talked a little bit about what folks can do in Virginia. Um, what can folks who don't live in Virginia do? Um, the million dollar question. I would love, anyone who wants to answer this would love to hear from you. I'll teach her it, okay. Well, I think, I mean, I think Delegate Askew and Congressman, Congresswoman Loria mentioned it, right? Like write those postcards, do, do the phone banks, text and donate, right? You don't have to be physically present to be a part of these campaigns. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that our, our contact rates on the doors are, are way lower than what we're used to, right? Because people are still getting used to being, you know, face to face with folks and interacting with people, which means that we actually just have to do more passes on the doors, right? And we're going to get those IDs up and we're going to have more conversations, but it means we start earlier, like really a whole lot earlier, no break after June 8th kind of thing. Um, but it also means we have a layered approach, right? It's not enough to just do doors. It's not enough to just do phone banks or not enough to do texting. You got to like, you know, Delegate Ask, you mentioned getting up on TV. I usually don't like to spend a whole lot of money on paid communications. I can't tell you how much more my mail budget went up in the last like two years because, you know, we have to still get our, our, get our candidates name IDs out there. We still have to get our issues out there. And it's, you know, that, that being really strategic around that layered approach is really important. Um, we knocked on doors in Fairfax County about three weeks ago and we had timed it just 
right after our mail had dropped. And so when our folks were knocking on the doors, the folks they talked to were like, oh yeah, I just saw your mail piece, right? And I think those things are really important. And so for folks out of state, I think, you know, finding uh, an in-state, you know, campaign, a candidate you want to wrap your arms around, find, finding an in-state organization that has, you know, plans in place to, to do voter contact and voter outreach, I think is really important because we're thinking about all of those layered approaches and we're thinking about the timing and the sequencing of when we're in a particular area or county or region. Um, and I think that's what is going to get us through what I call this weird transition year where we're kind of slowly getting back to normal, but we might revert back and we don't really know what's going to happen. And so to be as nimble as possible. Um, and I think there are lots of folks in state that are really paying uh, you know, deliberate attention to, to what's going to work this year and what's not. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Tram. Um, that is all the time we have for conversation. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about action in just a second, but before we do so, I want to just thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Congresswoman Loria. Thank you, Delegate Askew. Thank you, Tram. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for your time and your thoughtful conversation. This has been incredibly motivating and inspiring. I know I am super excited to make some phone calls into Virginia. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us this evening um, from home. So uh, in just a moment, you're going to see our, um, yes, perfect. So ways to get involved, you can go to swingleft.org slash panels. This will have opportunities to get involved in Virginia. It'll be through um, donating to specific strategic races, supporting Virginia orgs, phone banking, writing letters um, with Vote Forward in late June. It includes um, ways to support all of our panelists. Um, and again, we've talked about this a lot, but Virginia is the bellwether state. Virginia is where it begins. Swing Left is already supporting six very tight races um, in Virginia. We are going to be supporting our first governor's candidate this year ever, which is super exciting. Once the, uh, the June primary happens, we'll know who that is. Um, and we are also going to be expanding our uh, target list. So we will be supporting even more very close by the margins. It's going to every door you knock on, every phone call you make, every letter you write is going to be what makes a difference. So if you go to swingleft.org slash panels, all of the calls to action are listed right there for you in one easy place. That way you don't have to track down a bunch of different links. So again, that's swingleft.org slash panels. Um, I wouldn't be doing my job as a former organizer if I didn't pitch one more time joining some phone banks with us. Um, Swing Left is hosting Virginia phone banks, but also let's say you've been inside all year, you haven't spoken to strangers in a while and you're a little nervous about doing it again. On June 3rd, we're doing a phone banking training uh, that'll get you ready and ramped up and ready to go to make these phone calls and to really make the difference in Virginia and help us secure um, the democratic trifecta and really help us jumpstart our way into the midterms in 2022. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again to all of our amazing panelists. And I hope you all have a great night and I'm excited to see you all with us in Virginia.